Welcome to Retro Fanfic Retrospective, the podcast where we dredge up old fanfiction and expose it to the cold, harsh light of 2019. My name is Amato, and with me are... Tori. And Dom. And CJ. Ah. That's right. We have CJ and me in the same place at the same time. <laughs> we are not the same person. <laughs> <laughs> Unless we're the same person doing two different voices. Also, oh, oh, Billy West kind of character. <laughs> well, I'll never tell. Yes. But... We've moved away from Star Wars. We did Star Wars last week, and you missed it, CJ. Oh, how could you? Instead, we're talking about the other most defining franchise of American pop culture. That's probably not true. I just made that up. No, that's completely wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I just made that up. Anyway, Harry Potter. CJ, could you tell us your background with Harry Potter? I read it. Mm-hmm. I loved it. Mm. And I went on Pottermore twice, took the test twice. Gryffindor, all the way. I don't know about you guys. I um, always get Gryffindor, too. Hufflepuff. Yeah. Every time. <laughs> huh. I married a Hufflepuff. <laughs> yeah. Good good folk. <laughs> yeah. You know, I want to, like, place a bet that anybody with, like, Scorpios, for sure, Gryffindors. And Sagittarius is probably, t- uh, yeah. <laughs> Maybe anybody with a moon in Scorpio might was a Gryffindor. Because I think how they measure it is, like, a sense of emotional intensity i didn't really think that's how they do but that's my theory i'm a rabbit what does that do for me mm. well i'm a rabbit too so you're probably gryffindor yeah. <laughs> like 98 percent of the yeah. population <laughs> i know <laughs> only the population that matters yeah exactly <laughs> and my wild miranda is a, a slytherin <laughs> and they're happy about it too mm. yeah. i actually um the 10 year old that i work with he was really insistent that he was a Slytherin because of the Pottermore test. And then he got really upset because he didn't want to be Slytherin. And I was like, you don't have to be. And he's like, no, but the test told me, so I have to be. It was a really kind of devastating conversation. Like, you got to read about the Sorting Hat, kid. I know. Read about it. Sorting Hat is fickle. Yeah. Sorting hat, it listens to yeah. what you want. It does. So all of us are, were into Harry Potter in one way or another at one point, I think. When did each of us get into it. For me, I think I ended up finally reading uh, Prisoner of Azkaban because everyone had been reading Harry Potter for a while at that point. I was like, sure, let's let's try it. And after that, I was following the books until the end. I wasn't, I didn't do anything besides read the books though. I wasn't into the fandom or anything like that. Mm. I have a bit of a story with that. I was raised as a Jehovah's Witness Mm -hmm. and the doctrine at the time, well, I'm sure still now, is that Harry Potter is, like, the devil's work. <laughs> so if you read it, you become, like, a, a witch or a wizard or something. Cool. Yeah. I know. I know. Right? It's long, right? But I wasn't allowed to read it. So, and I think it was around the time Prisoner of Azkaban was out, mm-hmm. but not Goblet of Fire. Mm-hmm. And I was in sixth grade, and my teacher started, my homeroom teacher started reading Harry Potter out loud didn't realize what it was until she started reading and then I was like this is awesome (laughs) just let it go like I was supposed to say something like leave the room I just let it go and it was great and I I read it secretly from then on so out of curiosity what does Jehovah's Witness doctrine say about Star Wars oh that it's fine I guess (laughs) (laughs) they're fickle I think they're under the domain of a different god out there. Mm, makes sense. Yeah, <laughs> I, I haven't uh, been in touch in a while, so I can't, I don't know, I, I wouldn't know. <laughs> Star Wars is a long time ago, so it's before the Covenants. It was a long, long time ago in a mm-hmm. galaxy far, far away, so exactly. what do they have to say about it? I do remember a lot of the scandal. It wasn't just among Jehovah's Witnesses, but mm-hmm. anybody with a very, like, fairly... Um, devout Christian background just thought the the witches and the wizards Mm -hmm. were so, you know, they were Satan's spawn or whatever, which it's funny because I feel like Harry Potter does skirt that line of like not being high fantasy, but being like this kind of urban fantasy that draws directly on something that people could identify as like modern Satanism, even though it wasn't that at all. Uh, it was just kids practicing magic. It was just... But nobody ever picked on, like, you know, any of the other fantasy books that were out. or Like, not particularly in that way. Maybe it's because they weren't as popular. It but. wasn't as popular, and I think they were 
turning an evil symbol, the witch, into something good sure, yeah. and positive and, maybe and something you can relate to, right? Yeah, specifically because they used the word witch, I think, was a big part of it, to be yeah. honest. Yeah. yeah. But uh, Personally, I caught into it at about the same, t- same time period um, after Prisoner of Azkaban, and um, uh, enough to be excited for the midnight release of the of the Goblet of Fire. Yeah, yeah, yeah mm-hmm. me too. And that point afterwards, at every midnight release, we try to get a book, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. or um, or three. So all four, I think. So my two sisters and my mom could all read it as soon as possible. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I was the fastest reader, so we put in a pre order, <laughs> pick it up. I'd read through it, and then I'd pass it to my sister. It was like ritual. Yeah, we're, we're all at uh, comparable reading speeds. We did, we'd have races, but it'd still be different every time, so we couldn't. <laughs> no <different way. laughs> I feel like Prisoner of Azkaban was when it really took off culturally yeah. and when yes. everybody was getting into it. That's when I remember seeing like a newspaper article about it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Every single person in America except Tori. Yeah, well, I was actually just talking to my coworker who's really into Harry Potter because I was sharing about our podcast. And, you know, she was like, Prisoner of Azkaban is really where the writing became really good. That's where, like, mm-hmm. everybody really started to love it. And it made me feel, like, yeah, a little sad because when I was 12, I read the first book and I was disappointed because for the last couple years, everybody had been raving about it and I expected great things and I was very disappointed. So I didn't persist in reading it. And... Yeah, it, it, it's kind of sad, because everybody got really into it. And, like, all my friends really into the fandom. They were really into Harry Potter. And I was just like, I tried, y'all. I tried. <laughs> but then after the sixth... I went and saw the movies with my family, because my brother was into it. And we saw the movies. After the sixth movie came out, I had to know what happened. I was so engrossed in the story. Oh, so I went right. out, and I bought the seventh book. And I read that all in one summer. And, you know, this was... I must have been in college at that point, you know, because it took years to come out. And I really liked the seventh book. Like, I I definitely found it, like, maybe not the most, like, uh, I don't know. What's the word? It's it's not, like, uh, high culture or anything, but it's really (laughs) fun to read, you know. And I loved fantasy books growing up. I just kind of had an elitist perspective on them. I was like, I like high fantasy, you know. (laughs) Because I was a little jerk. This is so, low, there low, you go. Low dirty fantasy. I know. <laughs> well, Tori, I was, just, I was a little jerk, okay? I thought I was better than everyone because I read at a college level and I was four, you know, whatever. Not four, fourth grade. Yes, I read at a college level when I was four. Let the listeners keep that track. I'm just kidding. If it'll help bridge the gap, Tori, I can probably find a Harry Potter sort of genre crossover somewhere. Would love that, yeah. No, because I loved, the, yeah, I loved Terry Brooks as a kid, so... Now, as we mentioned back when we read Draco Dormi and I Can't Speak Latin. Why do you always... <laughs> you've said it once before, right? Uh, I, I probably said it. I don't know about that. The Harry like Potter... There's always just been attempts. Yeah. <laughs> the Harry Potter fandom was super big, and that included the fanfic scene. And there were some really early all-star... Not all-star, like but really big hit fanfics. And that was one of them. And our fanfic for today, The Very Secret Diary by Arabella, was another one. This one was originally written in 2002, and it's based specifically and entirely on Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets. Which is also not that great of a book in the series. <laughs> like, the first two books aren't that good, and the third book's where it picks up. You gotta hook them young, Dom. You do, yeah. <laughs> I still really liked the first and second books. Yeah. And, and honestly, like, reading this fanfic made me kind of really enjoy the story of Chamber of Secrets a lot more, so... yeah. Like, if this was included in the book, that would make made, made the book a yeah. lot better. Well, yeah. this is a question that the book made you ask, mm-hmm. right? Right. Right when you figured out what was going on, you're like, what was that like? <laughs> what happened there? It's like a yeah. full you year? Know? What the heck? <laughs> now, CJ, why don't you tell us the premise of this fanfic, then? The premise is following Ginny Weasley and her interaction with the diary, entirely inside of the diary as diary entries throughout the book, The Chamber of Secrets. From the time she gets it to the end of the book. This diary in question is, of course, the diary kept by Lord Voldemort as a 16-year-old student, uh, you know, under his original name, Tom Riddle. Tom Moldova Riddle. And in the book, it's established that he kind of weaponized and left it behind to open the Chamber of Secrets at some point in the future. And later on in the series, it's retconned into being a phylactery, horcrux, whatever. It's like horcrux plus... Yeah. 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 Um, so it, it has a piece of his soul in it and, you know, is very, very evil. 
almost as evil as the book from the first Care Bears movie, I would imagine. <laughs> <laughs> Which is also pretty evil. And so early in Chamber of Secrets, Ginny Weasley gets slipped the book by Lucius Malfoy, who just has it for some reason. Yeah, and he's just so cavalier with Voldemort's things. <laughs> he's yeah. just like, I don't want this anymore. Let's Take it. Take They're, it away from me, child. They were just carrying it around the shopping alley and then saw them and decided to slip it into the... That's another question. Yeah. Did yeah. he know what it was and why it would yeah. be dangerous? Yeah, he definitely did. So, yeah. so yeah, that was what I was going to say. Is like, was there a, ever an explained motivation for this? There was like, in the last couple of chapters of the book. Ah. Yeah, I mean, he wanted it to do its thing, right? But this is a piece of Voldemort's soul left behind for the purpose oh, of but... manipulating someone into opening the Chamber of Secrets. Wouldn't... Why wouldn't he have just given it to a Slytherin? Like, maybe not his yeah, son, because it's kind of dangerous. Because he wanted a Gryffindor to do it, specifically the kid of the person that was um, against him in the Ministry of Magic, who was for all these muggle um, protection laws. So he wanted their kid to commit muggle murders. Yeah. And so to get both the, the kid and the, the, the parent out of the Ministry of Magic. And okay. being possessed guess that does make sense. why do that to one of your own? I guess. I yeah. Okay. yeah. And because okay. right. they also knew Voldemort and probably wouldn't wish that on most other people <laughs> that, that they liked. Fair enough. Yeah. And so at the very end of the Chamber of Secrets, the book, not this fanfic, um, the spirit of spoiler Tom Riddle... <laughs> <laughs> this podcast is a spoiler. Alert. Yeah, we might be spoiling some of the content of Harry Potter. <laughs> Yeah, and if but if at this point you haven't seen the movies or read Harry Potter, then I just don't know what to tell you. Why <laughs> I think are you you're here? a little out of touch. <laughs> yeah, because I heard CJ was back. Uh, That's right. right. Yeah. That's a drop. I know. Back just in famous. again. Yeah, we didn't CJ even advertise that. <laughs> Tell a friend. Ad for what? There's spies are everywhere. <laughs> I mean, we didn't even mention it at the end of last episode that this would be happening. It's always just a surprise when we have a guest. Anyway, what I wanted to say was that at the end of the Chamber of Secrets, the spirit of Tom Riddle gets to have a expository info dump about what's been going on with him and Ginny Weasley. Mm -hmm. And that's where the author got most of the broad strokes of what happens in the communications in this fanfic. Um, and I guess for some fanfics, we can go blow by blow about what actually happens in it. And I don't think this is really one of those fanfics. Not Most of the really. stuff that happens no. is the stuff that uh -huh. happens in the Chamber of Secrets of the book. Right. Yeah. yeah. But there, I think we can talk about it in terms of sort of stages of the relationship between Ginny and Tom Riddle in the diary. Right. Yes. Does that make sense to everybody? Mm-hmm. Certainly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think um, the first thing I thought when I finished this particular piece was Arabella who hurt you? <laughs> because the the emotional and mental abuse oh, yeah. inflicted yes. by Tom Riddle onto Ginny Weasley, and it is shown in full, there's not a skipped entry in this entire thing, yeah. is so realistic and so convincing, it blew me away. I was like, who hurt you? <laughs> because yeah. this is too real no, for me it, right It's now. spot on. Um, and this was really unique in a lot of the fanfics we've read and and i do think in many ways this is a compliment to the author a lot of times when i see portrayals of you know abuse and like this grooming stuff that happens in this gaslighting in these fanfics it's done very cavalierly and in a way that i just have to set it down and be like i can't right now this snuck up on me, mm -hmm. and it would build up in a way where I was reading and reading and reading and really engrossed until all of a sudden I'd be like, oh my god, I'm overwhelmed, this is too much. And I, it's a weird way to compliment the author that they mirrored my own experiences of abuse so well. But That's how abuse works. It, it was yeah. brilliantly written yeah. in that sense. And like, there's nothing I can say that's critical of the author because they didn't they didn't do it like they were sensitive in every possible way they just they did it so well that it was a very difficult read i think one could say perhaps because not a single entry is skipped and this is a year long mm -hmm. time span we're looking at here not an entry is skipped so sometimes you can be like well this is repetitive yeah like here's an 11 year old girl yes. just going on and on and on about the same thing but it's so necessary in a way to make it as realistic as it is, I think, by the end. Like, yeah. to have it all built up yeah. 
to the end. Maybe not entirely necessary, but... I, I agree. I think the author was kind of committed at that point to doing the whole thing, mm -hmm. but in terms of a story and a piece of writing, you didn't need all those entries in there. No. It, no, it does but... help a little bit just because you do see the kind of slight pushing and pullback, like the ebb and the flow, mm -hmm. and like the kind of gradually pushing the envelope and manipulation. But I feel like when I was like 60% through the book, I started kind of skipping forward. And I'm glad I didn't just leave it off because towards the end it all, it becomes really powerful in a different way. Yeah. Um, but it, it's a little much in yeah. some ways. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's like what I was trying to say is that it's it's not too much. Like it's actually perfectly realistic. Mm -hmm. And like that's what makes it so difficult to read. And that's what makes it so well written at the same time. The ebb and the flow is very necessary for what the author was trying to accomplish, which is that level of realism in terms of the like grooming pattern that Voldemort perpetrates on Jenny. Mm -hmm. So I, I think it was necessary. I just don't know if I, it's hard to say I enjoyed it, I yeah. guess. You know? <laughs> well, I kind of enjoyed the um, characterization of Voldemort throughout it. Yeah. Because you can kind of tell what they're thinking uh, along with all the stuff that's going on. They're trying to figure out, as a sixteen-year-old future evil villain, what their what their adult selves did, how they did it, how they failed, and how they feel about that. <laughs> throughout they, these little what hints, what they do about that? What, that was, what are yeah, they, they going to do? Body, yeah. yeah, that was a really interesting thread. Yeah, mm -hmm. where Tom Riddle is just completely flabbergasted about the concept of Harry Potter. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, what? yeah, and so, just trying not to push it too much because they they have to like maintain this facade. Yeah, mm -hmm. and have yeah. to mm -hmm. you know keep her interested in around. But yeah, just you know, finding those little entry and all stuff like Tom was getting uh, uh, Jenny to copy bits of the history book about Harry about about Voldemort, and was flabbergasted that the last two chapters are entirely about Harry Potter. It's like two <laughs> chapters, <Yeah>. two chapters. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I love all those little bits, right? Because uh, yes, he's getting more information about what he ended up doing in the future, and you know all the things that happened to him. One of the things is like he finds out Grindelwald, who was the Dark Lord du jour back when he was 16, yeah. mm -hmm. like fell like a couple years later to Dumbledore. And, like no one knows how, and so he's annoyed at that. Mm -hmm. But then he's like, and so wait, Voldemort didn't arise for like another 20 years? What was and he like, what, doing? What, what, yeah. what, what was I yeah. doing? <laughs> what took me so long? I'm ready now. So, yeah. <laughs> As and you're kind of like, yeah, what was he doing? <laughs> yeah, that's the funny part, just because are we ever told what Voldemort was actually doing? No, they, they don't time? really go into the blow-by-blow, blow, no. I'm sure he was just gathering everything he could. Yeah. Yeah. Well, actually I mean, being smart about it as opposed to being an egotistical 16-year-old. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was interesting to watch that character kind of evolve as well. Mm -hmm. It was probably mm -hmm. my favorite part. I guess. It was a jackass 16-year-old because they named themselves Lord Voldemort. And he's so proud about it, too. Voldemort. I, I am Lord Voldemort, yeah. Well, you don't expect the young Lord Voldemort to be a nice guy. <laughs> he's going to be <laughs> full of himself. and like, If he feels like he has the power of life and death over people, then he can... It's just like, in general, the whole confusion choice. of there's no connection between... Tom Riddle and Voldemort, how that seems to be a lost thing. And you think people would have researched yeah. that at some point? Yeah. True. I, I was going to go back to the I am Lord Voldemort thing <laughs> and say what was always funniest about that to me is that you would assume that it, in looking at his name and coming up with the, um, what's the word I'm looking for? A anagram. Anagram mm -hmm. for it. Um, he had to think first the words I am Lord I know, and then he just used it. the remaining letters to come up with something else. <laughs> that's true. Like, that's what I always think of. Like, it's like, I am Lord. Hmm. What are the other things spelled? Uh, Voldemort. Mort, okay, that Mort works. is small, death in French. Yeah. Okay, and then Vold. Vold, well, yeah. They, they live on Battle Latin, so it's perfect for that. Yeah. <laughs> like Voldo from, uh, what is that? Video game. Mario Kart? Mm hmm. It's like, he, <laughs> sure, why not? It's like he, no, he could have come up with. He could have come up with, like, Lord, Lord Voldemati or something, and he was like, that's too anything. much. Yeah. Like, <laughs> fold the I am in. Mm -hmm. But. I just think it's really silly. Anyway, <laughs> their Latin classes have to be terrible. Mm hmm. <laughs> Which is do, ironic because take... they do spells in Latin. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> More or less. So... 
So the most entertaining part of the fanfic is probably Lord, Lord Voldemort, or rather Tom Riddle, getting very pissy that he ends up being taken out by a baby who is then celebrated for the accomplishment. <laughs> <laughs> but and, and then being frustrated that about the events of the previous book where uh, an eleven-year-old Harry Potter stopped Lord Voldemort again. Right. <laughs> yeah. like, very irritated, and yeah. no one knows how. Yeah. Uh, but but the meat and potatoes is the relationship between Tom Riddle and Ginny. So going back to the very beginning, Ginny gets this diary. She starts writing in it because she's like, oh, yeah, I wanted to write it in the diary. And he starts communicating with her. And at first he's very disoriented. And he's like, who are you? What's the year? Mm-hmm. And also, he's very weak. Um, that's communicated by him using a lot of ellipses, which seems like a very verbal way to communicate that. Like, he was really just, like, writing out what he's saying with dot, dot, dot. I think you can extrapolate yeah. that as time passing between mm. the Well, they, they expressed up. that inside the, the fic itself using space. Yeah. Right? So if it had been, yeah. like, word, space, word. That makes sense, that yeah. worked better because it's, like, word comes up, fades, wait, word comes up, fades. Yeah. But having the ellipses was really awkward. I'm glad you pointed that out. It... When I first started reading it, I was like, if these ellipses stay here, I'm going to have a really hard time finishing this fanfic. It annoyed me. <laughs> yeah. By the way, when talking about the formatting, I neglected to mention that the story was originally hosted at a website called The Sugar Quill, which was all about Harry Potter fan fiction, taken offline in 2014. And what we are reading is a copy that somebody else put up on Archive of Our Own hmm. uh, later. Mm-hmm. Just FYI. Uh, okay, so, but what else can we say about or what can we say in general about the early relationship with Ginny and Tom? It begins just, with him, yeah. like like you said, trying to orient himself and then um, starting to ingratiate himself with this very naive 11-year-old girl and being mm-hmm. like, well, if this is what I got, I can work with this, you know. And it was a pretty good naive 11-year-old girl writing, too, yeah. I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah. He starts off claiming he's just an enchanted diary. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And he goes for, like, the sympathy early on because he really needs someone writing in him, both for information and for energy. Mm-hmm. And so he says, oh, like, I've been closed for, what is it, 50 years? And some horrible person has kept me in a dark place, and you really need to keep writing to me as much as possible. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, you know, that works. And then, of course, the oldest trick in the book, make the other person talk about themselves, mm-hmm. right? So he's like, yeah. tell me all about your mean brothers and, yeah. you know, all this stuff. <laughs> And I do have to say, yeah, it was really realistic 11-year-old girl writing. I had mm-hmm. older brothers growing up. This is very real. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the annoyance <laughs> with older brothers <laughs> is really well captured in this fanfic. So. Oh, yeah. Like, at this point in Chamber of Secrets, Harry is staying with the Weasleys for the summer. Mm-hmm. And she has a crush on him, and all her brothers know it, and they won't shut up about it. And so cruel. it's yeah. really... <laughs> They're really being assholes about it, like, yeah. genuinely. Except yeah. Percy. Uh-huh. Percy's pretty nice throughout the whole thing. Yeah, yeah. Well, Percy's pretty kind of nice and redeeming for Percy because yeah. nobody likes Percy. Uh-huh. You never see a good side yeah. of Percy. He's nice to Ginny, and I'm like, hey, all right. He's, he's nice, and he's the only one that pays attention later and notices things are wrong. Yeah. 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 And actually watches out for he's her later. He's a good big He's brother. the only one who has no interest in teasing her at all. Mm. He's, yeah. he's too yeah. business Which makes to them, do that. <laughs> but just well, instantly makes them a better person. Yeah. It's up there... Bill, right? Because Bill's like Bill always away. Nice. Bill and Charlie were also nice. I yeah, think. they were also nice. I think the main thing is that Fred, George, and Ron always cheese, tease Ginny. But Mostly when you have Fred six and older yeah. brothers, like, mm-hmm. dang, that's got to be a lot. It's a lot. So yeah. Ginny has a lot to complain about about that. And I, I definitely thought it was really good in this when she's responding to her older brothers teasing, being like, I hate them. This mm-hmm. sucks. Because they really do bad things to her. Like, some of the things they do are really awful. Mm-hmm. And a lot of it is kid shenanigans. But, like, you they know. They think they're being funny and they're, like, and they're as the Brits say, shaking the piss. They're actually really bad. Yeah. 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 But she's, yeah, she's very upset. But she's very upset, and and it's very common in families for that to happen. But then Tom will seize upon that and turn that into, oh, let me feed on your hate. Feed your Uh, hatred. Yes. (laughs) Tom to the dark dark side. (laughs) Tom finds out at some point that negative emotions and I think even tears Mm -hmm. power Tom Tom up more than anything else. And so early on, Mm -hmm. it's mostly just like, no, let it all out. Like, tell me everything. What's your worst secret? When when was the time you felt the shittiest? Let me know. (laughs) Because a horcrux is created when someone is murdered, right? Mm -hmm. Right. And I always thought that this horcrux in particular, the diary horcrux, Mm -hmm. was created when his father was murdered, but since he doesn't seem to know that in the fan Yeah, that can't... That can't have been... It was with uh, Morty Myrtle was murdered, I think. 
Mm, that makes sense, but he wasn't oh, the one who yes. did that by his own hand. I'm not sure the rules are that. Yeah, <laughs> it's, fair enough. it's unclear. <laughs> I gotta but brush up on my dark arts. <laughs> it's very interesting though that you bring that up, CJ, that yeah. about his father's because death. Because he does ask about that. Yeah. He asks about it a lot in this fan fiction. And it's pretty funny because he's he's acting like he's letting her assume that he cares about what happens to his dad. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but he's a psycho. He just wants to know is that, that is that jerk dead? <laughs> yeah. I want to know. Yeah. <laughs> like, yes, tell me he's yes. dead. Yeah, he spends pretty a lot funny. of time having Jenny go to the library to look things up for him when one is. Which is fair. I need to know what happened to my father. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, so sad and tragic. In the early part of the fanfic, the early forms of abuse and emotional abuse, and there's going to be many different forms of abuse going on in this fanfic, the early forms are kind of emotional blackmail. And so, mm-hmm. for example, he'll be like, oh, I thought we were friends. I thought you could tell me yes. anything. Or like, right. I've been God. nothing but good to you. Mm-hmm. And when she almost accidentally leaves the diary behind at home instead of taking mm-hmm. it to Hogwarts, which she didn't even mean to do, mm-hmm. that's he's like withholding his affection, being like, "Oh well, if if that's how little I mean to you, then you know." Yes. Mm-hmm. And and I do want to say like that's the first like very that was the first like very upsetting thing that like I mm-hmm. think anybody would have realized as an adult, but she's 11. Mm-hmm. So yeah. it's that deliberate, very clear guilt tripping that's like, yeah. I, you obviously don't care about me if you would mm-hmm. leave me behind. But this sneaks up on anybody in any relationship, and it happens to everyone. Mm-hmm. But I didn't want to say that like, the earliest signs of abuse mm-hmm. were like in the first chapter where like he goes, what a good girl. How rare. What is your name? And she tells him, and he's like, um, you know, such an uncommon and interesting name. And then, like, he says, uh, she says she doesn't like her name. And he says, well, I don't like my, well, we have something in common, you know? And so he's, like, literally just, like, seizing on these tiny little points of interest and, like, calling her good girl. Like, that was the first thing to creep me out. But then, mm-hmm. yeah, there's, as we move on, the very deliberate guilt tripping it's very subtle is the only thing I wanted to point yeah, out. Yeah, to start out with. To start out with. <laughs> but it gets bad pretty fast. Mm-hmm. And on the well, I think the chapter intentional guilt trip is the first, like, very deliberate bad. Very yeah. deliberate, yeah. Um, chapter 21, she's in Hogwarts, and she's tired or something, and she doesn't want to write to him mm-hmm. that long for that day. And she's like, I don't feel like writing. I'll, I'll talk to you later. And for the next several days she'll write to him and he won't answer yeah which is punishing so her punishing her yeah for mm-hmm. for not talking to him when he wanted her to which was really clever just really clever yeah it's of the writer yeah. not not him it's, yeah it's <laughs> yeah no i mean it's but just, that's very real right the, the yeah, cold it's shoulder so real yeah it's so real you know pulling her in like making her you know come closer and closer trying to get that affection back trying to get that attention back and you know what's funny is that most people perpetrate this form of abuse because they crave attention and affection. Mm-hmm. And we're led to believe that Voldemort just wants power, but I feel like that's the deceptive element in this story that makes Voldemort, like, a more human character, even though, like, you know, abuse is is actually a very human thing. It's super messed up, but it's because people crave, like, affection. Yeah, He's insecurity. That. Yeah, insecurity, the insecurity on the part of Tom Riddle sneaks yeah. out a few times. It really uh, does. Mostly when, like, anyone challenges him on his perception of himself or the way he presents himself mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. as being very... Like, what's an example yeah. of that? Um, um, well, just early, early on, he accidentally lets a picture slip when he's weak of him in an orphanage. Yes. And he really did not want to show yep. any kind of, like, sad sack backstory because then, like, any time, yep. much later on, Ginny expresses some sympathy about it. He's yeah. like... He does not very, want it. He's like, I'm no, the powerful yeah. Lord Voldemort. Yeah. I'm, you know, I'm not a poor orphan boy. Yeah, like, he, oh. yeah Jenny yeah. says, like, oh, we're the same. We, we both grew up poor. Mm-hmm. We have a lot in common. He's like, we have nothing in common. I'm better than you. Shut up. Right, yeah. exactly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I, I'm just looking, like, at the end of this period of, of the cold shoulder, you know, he just kind of pops back up. Mm-hmm. And she's like, oh, you know, I'm so sorry. Do you forgive me? And he's like, what are you talking about? There's nothing to forgive. Like, yeah. I just thought you were bored of me, so I just didn't talk to you for a while, you know? The gaslighting starts around now, both in those terms and in terms of he starts getting a little more comfortable writing to her. Mm-hmm. And therefore comfortable expressing sarcasm and disdain in plausibly deniable ways. Yeah. Which mm-hmm. he does a lot because he wants to... 
He wants to entertain himself, basically. He's not doing just enough to control. He's doing enough to control and have fun at Ginny's expense. Right. Pretty much. And, and so, you can use the, like, the text excuse, right? Yeah, like, absolutely. You didn't know my tone. It was, just, it's, it was writing. <laughs> He's like, it's so yeah. hard to communicate tone through texting. Like, yeah. And I can't use emojis. I, I can only write. <laughs> How can you assume that terrible thing about me? Exactly. Mm-hmm. And she's like, well, it sounded pretty sarcastic. And Wait, he's you like, said no, something shitty. Though. <laughs> I, I can't, I can't yeah. believe you would think that that's what I meant. Obviously, that's not what I meant. How Such could another... you know I'm your friend? Such yeah. another classic abuser tactic. Like, mm-hmm. how dare you think anything bad about me? Like, mm-hmm. And one other thing is that she cannot check what was written in the diary before. Only he can show that mm-hmm. again. Yeah. Yes. And so she's unable to check her yes. own memory of how conversations yeah. went. It's like control. the perfect yeah. gaslighting tool, this oh, diary. It you know? really is. Oh. Terrible. And meanwhile, the, the diary does contain perfect memory of what was written. So yeah. at times they, they throw up words and phrases Ginny wrote out of context yeah. or to... Uh, Completely out of mm-hmm. context, yeah. yeah. He only starts doing that, you know, later on, kind of once I think they're more in open conflict, mostly. As a torture I feel like device, yeah. er- early on, when she first gets to Hogwarts, he kind of loosens the reins. He's like, no, go have fun, go make friends. Yeah. But then one of his early tactics at Hogwarts is he's kind of trying to make her think badly of any everyone else around her. Yes, mm. and, and suspect, so, especially the girls in the room. In the dorm, with yeah. With her, mm-hmm. so that he can kind of start manipulating her and then blame it on somebody else. And, right. But an also classic abuser tactic of cutting people mm-hmm. off from yes. their other relationships so that you can perfect control Mm -hmm. and like as soon as he notices that she's making friends with people those are the people like people like she picks the girl that she gets closest with to start accusing of maybe this girl's the one who's been moving your diary around because you take controls of the genie and and move the diary around and then blame it on these other people these other people yeah but he picks that specific person they're trying to read your diary yeah Mm -hmm. yeah Yeah. and also like when she complains about Hermione who she dislikes because Hermione hangs out with uh, Harry and she's jealous of Hermione like I, doesn't Voldemort kind of encourage that he's like oh yeah mm-hmm. she sounds terrible mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. well he thinks that she's terrible because she's muggle born that's so right so it's like yeah yeah. He, that's also the who he he tries to pin stuff on in Ginny's dorm like the mm-hmm. muggle born yes. girl mm-hmm. or one yeah. of them or yes. whatever oh that's a good point mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yeah and this is also when he starts trying to gather information. He's like, oh, I've been locked up for so long. I want to know everything. But uh, ends up steering her towards like stuff he wants to know, of course. Mm-hmm. She gets to tell him stuff that, he know, that she knows and grab books from the library. And I feel like books from the library are when he first has the motivation to try to exercise physical control over her. Mm-hmm. The first form that takes is by putting her into a hypnosis state. Um, un- under the guise of, oh, I'm going to teach you some magic. Right. Mm-hmm. Like, like, I'm going to teach you this, because you're really good at charms, that's like the form of magic that you're best at, and I want to teach you this charm to, like, copy stuff into my book so that I can read books, and that, that seems cool to her, too. Mm-hmm. And he kind of puts her into a trance state with, like, the, okay, focus on this, like, do this, and has her cast the spell so that a, a pen will write the contents of the library books into himself, but then she doesn't remember it properly afterwards. Right. Like, afterwards, she only remembers, you were going to teach me some charms, I don't remember after that. Mm-hmm. And he was saying, oh, you must, you were so exhausted. You, you know? must have forgotten. Right. Yeah. She's like, oh, and I found you under my bed, open with the books, and I, I swear I put you under my pillow. And he's like, must have been one of the other girls. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Halloween. It's a big turning point most of the time, I think, in these books. Yeah. Fair enough. Um, and that is the the point at which young Tom Riddle decides to take control of Jenny himself Mm -hmm. and send her on a mission Mm -hmm. to open the Chamber of Secrets. Well, early on, she had been worried about what house she'd be in, Mm -hmm. because all her brothers are in Gryffindor, and all main characters are in Gryffindor, and she's like, what if I'm in Slytherin or whatever? I like the little detail of the Sorting Hat seeing the Slytherin influence yeah, he's like, the there's, some, there's a little something in your mind. You want to be in What's Slytherin? What's going on? The ambition. <laughs> like, it, it, it did that to Harry Potter, too, didn't it? For the same or, reason. Because it was exactly. the same there was a horcrux somewhere in yeah. the vicinity. Yeah. <laughs> but, I know, but it was a very funny pair. There's a nice detail. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. But what I'm getting at there is that Ginny's a little bit insecure about her bravery, which is supposed to be a defining trait because she's a Gryffindor. Mm-hmm. Right. And that's kind mm-hmm. of an in that Riddle uses to kind of be like, oh, let's test your bravery by going and doing these things. Mm-hmm. And, uh, well, I guess before... Does he have her kill roosters before that? Oh, it's roosters yes. before Chamber yes. of Secrets, yeah. Right. Yeah, it's ramped so up So he that. starts sending her out to snap the neck of Hagrid's rooster. Yeah, not consciously. In a, hypno- not consciously. In a hypnotized state. Yeah. Mm-hmm. 
after uh, subtly asking what about whether there are roosters or not on the Hogwarts. Uh, Hogwarts ground in general. Just mm-hmm. asking about what animals. What kind of animals Hagrid are there? Keeps. Yeah. <laughs> and she's like, you know, there's, you know, the dog Fang, and there's a chicken coop, and he's like, are there chickens there? And she's like, yeah, it's a uh, chicken yeah. coop. <laughs> <laughs> he's like, okay. <laughs> and I like that the first time he does that, she does not end up killing a chicken, and no. he, he's like, I don't know what happened there, and it's just that you know he wasn't in deep enough, I guess. Well, she got caught on the way out. Oh, is that what happened? Yeah, she oh, got okay. turned back by a teacher. Mm. Mm-hmm. That happens a lot, is that, you know, she manages to encounter someone in her, like, sleepwalking or whatever. They start to call it sleepwalking. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I don't know if we want to address that yet. But no, that's fine. Right. Later yeah. on, at least she, he ends up keeping on sending her to do things. Sending her to do things. And chalks and it up to sleepwalking. Yeah, right? because she, they have identified she walks, like, with a, a regular gait and, like, doesn't seem to know where she's going. So her friends in her dorm start sending her back to bed and stuff and, like, identifying it as sleepwalking. Definitely, yeah, later later on. Yeah. And it starts with the rooster mm-hmm. when, she, exactly. when she comes in after having finally killed the rooster. And she's, like, wet, and she's got feathers on her. And, and she's blood. And blood, and she's super confused. And I think he somehow convinces her that the blood is paint. Mm-hmm. And that the feathers are from a, yeah, a, pillow uh, fight. a pillow fight that she doesn't remember having, <laughs> and then and then chalks it up, starts to chalk it up to sleepwalking. No, yeah, well, and this is also stressed. the point where the, the the writing is on the wall and the cat is petrified. But this is before that. This oh is no, before. the, the okay, rooster is before bad. that. Yeah. My question is: is um, was the mind control not good, or is Tom Tom Riddle too lazy to mind control Ginny to like change their clothes and get rid of the feathers before waking up. I think he's just not yet. Yeah, like I think he's just not that good. You know, he's just not in yet. And not was, entirely. Was there any reason he really needed a rooster killed? Because yeah. the call of the that? rooster kills a basilisk. The call of the rooster. Yeah. Okay, uh, that makes sense because or harms I feel like it or something. Later, kills, it. kills it. Yeah. Later on in the book. He's sending Ginny to do a lot of stuff, including like Chamber of Secrets related, related stuff. And mm-hmm. she knows that she has memory blanks and she's very worried about whether she's done terrible things. And for most of them, he's like, no, it, it is literally impossible for you to have petrified someone. You don't know how. You can't have done that. Don't yeah. worry about it. Mm-hmm. Right. Or like, you are not the heir of Slytherin. That is ridiculous. Don't worry about it. Yeah. But killing a rooster is something she very well could do. And she keeps coming back to that incident where she's she like, but, but, but well, quite sensibly. Because she knows a rooster was killed, mm-hmm. and she knows she had feathers on her and like and blood and you know, didn't blood, remember things, yeah. and so she's like, "But the rooster, though." Mm-hmm. And so I feel like that's kind of uh, a sticking point later on for her, for him being able to talk her down from mm-hmm. suspecting what's going on. Yeah, but it's the one thing that keeps her from completely succumbing. I think. Um, or, like, believing his his story. She's kind of like, well, I don't know. Yeah. It, it, like, I don't know about fight. that, though, because the feathers, and he's like, quick, go back. It was a pillow fight. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's you know? like she, she still kind of implies she trusts him, but she just doesn't necessarily, like, trust his opinion, right. you know? Mm-hmm. Like, At she doesn't point. think, you know, he's doing anything to her, but she's just like, I don't know, Tom. Like, this explanation isn't making sense. And so... From there, though, she also confides a lot in him. Like, what if I'm doing these terrible things? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But yeah, one thing I was pointing to is that, like, when the the chamber is open, writing appears. She also thinks that that is red paint. Like, I guess a lot of people oh, do. People and then she sure. sees the the quote unquote paint on herself. She's like, "Did I paint this?" Mm-hmm. I always thought it was a little bit funny. I'm like, you know, it, it's definitely blood. Uh, blood and paint of a lot of the same. Well, you probably relate to your experiences more yeah, for jumping I, to I'm covered in bodily fluid. It, sure, sure. That yeah isn't mine. Yeah, I'm still <laughs> walking. So what did mm-hmm. I do? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So Riddle sends her to like find the bathroom that opens the Chamber of Secrets. He's very amused that Myrtle is still a ghost because she has, he has nothing but disdain for her. She mm-hmm. has very interesting encounters with Myrtle. Or Myrtle's he, like as she continues to go into the bathroom, mm-hmm. Myrtle's just like, "What are you doing?" <laughs> mm-hmm. He he has her release the basilisk a couple of times, and in terms of being entertained, when Tom Riddle is extremely frustrated, <laughs> he he gets really pissed off that the basilisk gets released like three times and never manages to kill anyone. He's right. so mad. Mm-hmm. He's real because if you remember the books. If you see the basilisk, you die. Mm-hmm. If you see mm-hmm. its eye in a reflection, you get petrified. Mm-hmm. And so by the second time, he's like, what are the odds that <laughs> <laughs> that only happens in such specific circumstances? <laughs> yeah. Exactly. He's like, a camera? Like, who knew to have a mirror around the corner? <laughs> yeah. Like, he's like, they must, everybody must know. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. There's, there's a quote that I really like. 
um, going back to Halloween night just before he takes control of her and she releases the basilisk for the first time and writes on the wall and mm-hmm. all that sort of thing. Um, and he's, he's taking control of her and he says, Do not waver, my strong one, my brave one, my Virginia, open to me. They deserve death. They deserve, um, they deserve death. Those who have teased and hurt you, those who would mock and abuse you, find your hatred now. Call it into your mind and fix it there. Let it burn against them all. Only I trust you. Only I need you. Only I love you. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, she's taken. And that, that right there is like the, the, the abuse, like the essence of it right there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Up also, until that point. there's this thing that is never like brought up in the, the books um, or the movies, um, as far as everyone I know who's told me who's read the book, sorry, I haven't read the book, but that her name is Virginia. Um, the author notes that this was before her name was canonly established. Sure. Ginny was clearly a nickname, but they didn't sure. know what it was for. And it absolutely makes sense that it'd be for Virginia, but there's a thing early on where, like, Tom is like, I'm gonna call you Virginia, because uh, Ginny identifies, like, oh, my real name is Virginia, I don't know how I feel about people calling me Ginny, I feel it's kind of childish. So he continues to call her Virginia, even though she never specifies that, and there's something that comes up later about that that it's I think like we can his, address later, but it, yeah, yeah, yeah like I just thought we would, like, her, yeah, because he always calls her Virginia, her. I thought mm-hmm. we'd identify that, you know, in the, yeah. at this point. Yes, thank you for that. And so things get ramped up and up. She's more and more worried about the sleepwalking behavior and obviously, you know, also the deadly creature that apparently is being released from the Chamber of Secrets by the heir of Slytherin like is going on. What's the turning point where everything comes to a head with Tom Riddle and like she she like confronts him and he like reveals himself about what's going on? Good question. I have to find that. It is kind of subtle. There there is definitely a turning point, but there's like several turning point points before that. Like around um December or something, his tone starts getting a lot more terse mm-hmm. and he doesn't talk as much as much as just telling her what Uh to do. Mm -hmm. He's Uh, got her more addicted at that point, where it's like, even if she's not happy with him, she feels compelled to write in the diary. Yeah, like, Mm -hmm. at December 16th, um, they talk about Harry being a parcel mouth, and then, like, she's like, maybe... And then Tom's like, oh, well, then there you go. Harry Potter's the person that's doing it. And she's like, no, that doesn't make sense. He just basically starts talking down to her, and she starts, like, crying into the book. Mm -hmm. And then he just kind of tells her to shut up. Yeah. Uh, He said, "Um, I can control you. Go for a walk in the snow now. Go do it. And then then, then go find the rooster and then break his neck. That's right. There's a period where he's controlling her before she knows, like, Uh his his backstory for quite a while. Before she knows that he's Voldemort. He reveals that pretty late. Yeah, he gives her a a, a false backstory where he's been imprisoned by some jealous jealous rival. rival. Yeah. Yeah, and, you know, he's... For some reason, I guess his old girlfriend didn't care enough to, like, release him or try. <laughs> no, he said, like, when she found out, she went crazy and, you know, oh, yeah, went yeah, to yeah, save yeah, Mungo's. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah he's he, stuck in the diary of his He crafts this romantic backstory, and part of it is that, like, his, oh, his old girlfriend who went to Hogwarts, because I didn't go to Hogwarts, uh, definitely, I didn't yeah. go to Hogwarts. No, no, no. But my old girlfriend did, and she was a lot, you remind me a lot of her, you know? You know what? <laughs> I was kind of interested as to why the author chose to have him lie about not going to Hogwarts. I think... Or lie about. I think if if he went to Hogwarts, thing. there'd be a lot of questions of, oh, you did. Who who were you? Um, what house were you in? Who did yeah. you know? I who were the she professors? Could, she could have uncovered a lot of information about him. Yeah. 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 Like I think the sense. main point was to keep it vague about who he was, and the author skirted a lot of issues that way, because mm-hmm. Tom could just be like, oh, I went to some other school, and it was this and this. He was like, oh, I'm self taught. I just taught yeah, I was yeah, because also- that's what he ends up mm-hmm. saying is yeah. that he was taught by his his. Folks, I, I'm it sure it's also a, a good excuse to get uh, Virginia uh, Jenny to tell her stuff about Hogwarts at the time. Like, yes, who was that's true. Headmaster, true. Was like, oh yeah, tell me about. All, I just want to know. It's mm-hmm. So interesting. Yeah, uh, what was that? What does the lock on your door look like? Dumbledore's <laughs> yeah. headmaster now. Oh, that's mm. that's funny. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> and so he he basically reveals that he can control her and that he's acting like a jerk to her and you know yeah he's doing evil things and she's kind of starting to try to fight him on it but because yeah. uh, she after starts that, to yeah, hide her like she'll start to hide the diary from herself or like bury it under like lots of books or under trunks and stuff like that because like after that turning point she still expresses doubts and stuff but he gives up 
uh, providing explanations just takes over her mind and tells her to go do he stuff. Also, he also uses threats. He's like, oh, but if you reveal what you've been doing, yes. you're going to be expelled from Hogwarts, yeah. you're going to be in so much trouble, your dad's going to lose his job, like all these terrible things are going I to be happening like, mm-hmm. if mm-hmm. you tell anyone about me. I feel like you may have your lost... precious it. Harry will hate you. Right. Mm. Yeah. I feel like you may have glossed over that definitive turning point. What um, did you find? Well, no, it just... Do y'all remember what the definitive turning point was? Because it no. seemed to happen. I'm still looking for it. Because it seemed to happen like a snap. There was, like a, there there was, was something a cu- that. Uh, there was a couple. Because like December 16th to 17th mm-hmm. is when he stopped trying to explain things. Ah, uh, I see. Mm-hmm. And then after that, there was a definite, more antagonistic turning point. Mm-hmm. And it, to me, like, uh, I wish I could find it at the moment because I do feel like this was a, like very real. Like, it just kind of built up, and oh, there um, were these questions she had. Oh, yeah, go on. Uh, no. December 19th, he, uh, J- uh, Janie comes in and just says, I have a question for you. Uh, what is it? It's about uh, Vianne, your, uh, the, the made-up girlfriend. Mm-hmm. Uh, was she the same age as you? And he uh, uh, asked her a lot about about that, and he just, she catches him in a, in a lie. And that's he's just like, right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That is it. And that's yeah. when he drops the pretense. That's when he drops the pretense and also reveals that the name he made up, uh, Vianne Folio, is an anagram of naive fool. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> He's so proud of himself so for he, basic yeah. anagrams. He loves his anagrams. So he just, loves his he anagrams. just lets it go. He's just like, okay, you caught me. I'm evil. Ha-ha. I hate you <laughs> yeah. and everyone else, and you're my tool now. And she's right. like, I don't think so. And she starts trying to like yeah. get rid of the diary. And, and also, I love word scrambles. So. Yeah. <laughs> and but she's compelled to continue going back to yeah. the diary, right? Because he has enough of her soul to like have a hook. Isn't this there. so like a turning point in an abusive relationship? Like I felt like this was very real. Like where mm-hmm. you're like, wow, I just realized like all these lies. Like you start to see everything, but there's still something that is compelling and you know the history of the relationship continues to like draw you back and in this case it's tom's power mm-hmm. so it was an interesting like very direct turning point i felt that it was effective like i don't know if it would have been effective in any other context it was like it was like a switch from like trusting to not trusting but it was because she realized the lie yeah the, the it's like that be- uh, the, the, the point in the book, the turning point is um, she uh, confronts him about the lie, which is like the exact date that Myrtle died and like er, the thing mm-hmm. happened. And it's like, so Myrtle wasn't in the toilet yet, so you were lying. Blank space, which is no response. Yes. Then, I thought so. I'm going, I'm going to check something in the library. Oh, no, you're not. Yes, I am. We're in the common room, Tom, and everyone's all around packing up to leave for the holidays. So if you try and stop me, I'll yell for help. Try and stop you? Girl, be serious. How could a diary... I don't know how. You tell me how. Virginia, sweetheart, my name is Ginny. Yes. That's it. That's it. That was... Oh, yeah. That was the point I was going to bring up before, is that she comes around and she's like, I'm Ginny. It's Myrtle. That was the turning point. She was just like, she died at a different time, you said. Yeah. Yeah. He, like, listed a specific year at one point, which Mm -hmm. is... Yeah. And from then on, it's a kind of arms race of how she can stop herself from from serving his will. Mm -hmm. And she ends up doing various things like trying to bury her wand or like, I don't know, tie herself to the bed, I don't remember. And like she's being compulsed Mm -hmm. to Mm -hmm. still write in the diary against their will. So when they do, they do it out in the open in a common room with people around. Right. Which doesn't help a whole lot, but at least he can't like take her over right then. She does everything to escape from the situation. And she, she does it well. You know, she fights very hard and he makes her stay up all night, you know, and yeah. not sleep. Mm-hmm. And she's just, it, he's just, just going crazy. Her, so yeah, she's she can't trying resist to. Him when he actually, military-grade torture. Yeah, it goes on yeah. to physical yeah. torture, yeah. like, in terms of types it's of abuse. It's really messed up. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And uh, this end part is the toughest to read because it is just not even an abusive relationship. It is just torture and mm-hmm. control. Right. And it's at this point, just an abusive the, the, relationship. Well, okay. The it, diary is strong. It's much it more escalate. It's much more explicitly torture and control. Yeah, it, 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 it is very yeah. ugly. Yeah. Because at this point, the diary is strong enough where it doesn't need anything from Ginny specifically, except control over her hands and feet. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It just, just needs yeah, the opportunities, pretty much. Yeah, it becomes explicit now that um, the diary has control over her ability to like walk. You know, when she falls asleep, especially. Like, sleepwalking is what happens to her. But she still resists in terms of her hands, I think, is the main mm-hmm. thing, is that 
he can't have her hands. Like, he can't make her hands do anything. Or he not can make as her easily. walk somewhere. Yeah. Not as easily. Like, I think he does at times, but... After he's broken her a little bit. After yeah. a few yeah. nights of no sleep. And there's, like, points where he's talking to her later, which is um, when she's asleep. And that, that's mm-hmm. when he gets the, the information he wants at the time, when she's, like, uh, doing the thing where she's coming at the bottom of her trunk and, mm-hmm. like, bearing everything. Mm-hmm. 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 And then there's the fun little interlude with um, Harry Potter after that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And then we go oh, back right. to when... Which they skip. <laughs> she manages to flush the toilet. Uh, flush the toilet. Flush the, <laughs> the diary. toilet with a diary in it. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. She tries to get rid of the diary. But it's unharmed, and Harry finds it, just like in the book. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And that whole thing is just lifted straight from the book. Yeah, it's just in there. His communication with Yeah, they, they, they show like a chunk of it, and they're like, yeah, duh, yeah, duh, you, you know. It and it implies and, when he has the vision with yeah. Tom Riddle and like enters a diary or whatever. At this point, mm-hmm. Tom Riddle's target is really Harry more mm-hmm. than anything else. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, he's found out the whole Voldemort history and such, and he really wants like be able to confront, probably kill, or at least find mm-hmm. out what the hell is so special about Harry. Right. He's the one he's mm-hmm. most interested in, yeah. wants to talk to, and wants to kill the most. So, he's so happy. So he's yeah. so happy. Mm-hmm. So happy. And, and this is when Jenny becomes a bona fide badass. Yeah, because she, she steals goes, the diary she back. She steals it back to protect Harry mm-hmm. and try to get rid of the diary again. And Tom Riddle is so he's upset. So pissed. Mad. <laughs> mm-hmm. He's so angry. Proper chuffed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, starts calling her terrible names, and mm-hmm. this is when they, uh, Tom starts throwing stuff that uh, Jenny has written before back back at her. Yes. Yeah, and I feel like when I went back, I read this fanfic, and then I looked back at the Tom Riddle monologue in Chamber of Secrets to see what he said about what happened, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and I feel like the expansion of everything up until about now has been a very natural and heavily implied in the text expansion. Mm -hmm. And I feel like one of the author's main contributions is there's not an indication that she fought this hard in the original Mm -hmm. text. Mm -hmm. And she really, really fights this. And it's like the entire last, you know, Mm -hmm. part of the book. It's like the whole climax is her... Being a hero. Being a real hero about it, yeah. I do think this really helps unify the image of Ginny as she continues as a character. I agree. Yes. Uh, with this image of her in Chamber of Secrets. Because she continues to be like a powerful witch and a talented person and a strong person. It, As far as I know from the stories, um, you know. She comes across the in the expert, books. But it, this book does make her like seem weaker but this story makes her seem like she did everything she yeah. could and fought very hard and she was an 11 year old girl yeah. 11 yeah. I know and it's a lot you know like and she even figures out what's happening to her this abuse that's happening to her she figures it out and she fights as hard as she can and it's incredible what Riddle she accomplishes Riddle is literally grabbing her or using her body I guess mm-hmm. and it's like twisting her wrists and like physically torturing her to get her to do what he wants her to do and she still resists. Just he's trying to get her to slip away because school's in whole lockdown mode. Mm-hmm. After two people got um, Petrified. frozen, right? Mm-hmm. So like, you need to find a way, a time to slip away. Open the chamber, and she keeps saying like there was no opportunity. I could not mm-hmm. slip away. He's mm-hmm. like you liar. <laughs> in, in the um, mm-hmm. sleepwalking state, right? She says sleepwalking. Yeah, even then. Yeah, and and it, when she when he eventually does find a time to slip out, like he finally pieces together from everything she's saying. Like okay, wait. So the time to slip away would be after Defense Against the Dark Arts. Mm-hmm. There's the window. And she's like, yes. Because yeah. Lockhart like, is watching. Right. Yeah. And she, he's like, why didn't you tell me this before? Yeah, yeah, he, he said, you, what he said. He said yeah. you, you knew about this weeks ago, didn't yes. you? And yeah. she like, says, yep. yes. <laughs> like and months ago, yeah. I, I think he has a pause and he's just like, I am going to kill you so hard once I'm I am gonna through with this. I'm going to enjoy killing you. Right. Yeah. yeah. And so it's, it's really good. It's a good, I mean, uh, in terms of making Ginny a hero, making her strong, making the inevitable end of this book, like, of this story. You know how this story's going to end because you've read Chamber of Secrets, mm-hmm. and if you haven't, what are you doing? Yes. Mm-hmm. Um, but there's still drama, and there's still, like, heroism, and it's still a really strong climax, I felt, mm-hmm. because the author goes all in on Ginny mm-hmm. and her willpower. Yeah. And, mm-hmm. um, Tori, you were talking about this bridging the gap. My recollection of Ginny, once she becomes a prominent character again in about book five mm-hmm. in the books, mm-hmm. is that she comes across as very, like, unfazable. Yes. And when I was reading the books, I was like, well, that, okay, she's just kind of boring. I'm not sure where this came from. 
But coming from this fanfic, I'm like, oh yeah, she should be just like... She held off the Dark Lord, albeit a 16-year-old yes. version, but the Dark Lord by herself yes. for a year, for, basically. Well, I mean, really toward the end, like for a couple of months while he's trying to yeah. force her just to walk he's, and she won't do it. She's, she's getting it. very upset because he's up against the wall. He wants to open this chamber of secrets before Summer is let out. Like yeah. he's kind of got a deadline. Well, before the mandrakes are ready as well. Oh, before the mandrakes are ready to cure the people who were petrified, yes. right? You can then say it was a basilisk and then they'll... And it comes down to the wire like that, because yeah. she's been like preventing him from finishing it. Yeah, she's mm -hmm. been talking to it from since August and it was December when the turn happened. So it's basically from January to May. Mm -hmm. And then eventually June, where the real fight's happening about five, six months mm -hmm. of just pure psychological torture and willpower and fighting. There's a point where she literally just gives her wand to Percy and is like, you have this now. Yeah. Right. Not using it. Yeah. And she re relies on Percy a lot and Percy really steps up too. Yeah. She does. Yeah. I was like, good going, Percy. <laughs> they even include the small detail of her like finding Percy making out with a girlfriend at some point. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Which somehow helps because that's when... He learns that Defense Against the Dark Arts, like after that yeah. class, is when she can get away. And also the part in the, that's the point. book at the very end where she, where, where on the very last day, uh, she sits down with Harry Potter and Ron and tries to say something. It's like, I have to tell you a secret. Percy comes, up, oh, no, no, that's nothing. Don't worry about it. And like, shuts his journey away, not real, realizing what has happened. Thinking, oh, he thinks that, that's the secret. Yeah, I think that Jane's <laughs> going to talk about Percy kissing. <sighs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Scandalous. Mm -hmm. <laughs> a head prefect, no less. Well, we've established that, that all the <laughs> that um, all the brothers are shitheads, so right. probably would have yeah. sucked. But at the same time, there is that real sense of like sibling love, where mm -hmm. she's like, "But they're my brothers." You yeah, know? she knows mm -hmm. that they would lay down their lives for her, even though they're just complete assholes. <laughs> right. of the time. Yeah, I mean, and he doesn't you know. have to talk about that. He's like, "You hate them." And he like brings up all these, mm -hmm. you know, her words about what they've done to her and yeah. how she feels about them. She's like, "But they're my family." And yeah. He's like, yeah. "So?" And she's like, "You don't get it." <laughs> yeah. He really doesn't. And, yeah, and, yeah. And and that's, that's kind of the strong point in her character is that you know she's able to complain about her family and still love them and still accept them. It's like, yeah, like it is easy. Like I think when you're young, and I've been susceptible to this to see. For the first time, the ways your family may have mistreated you and, like, kind of gravitate to something else in response to that. And Ginny remains loyal to her family despite, you know, definite, definite elements of, like, them not treating her great. But she kind of understands that. Mm -hmm. But I do think, you know, for someone as young as her, that'd be an easy thing for an abuse party to come in and, like, prey on. And, and that's what Tom does. And, and that's very common as well. I was just going to say, Big Brothers can be pretty awesome. Even though they're yeah. absolute shitheads. In my experience. Right. It's a complicated experience. It's a complicated yeah. experience. Yeah. Siblings. Yeah. I think we can start to wrap this up. And is there anything that we didn't like about the fanfic before we start throwing some more praise at it? <laughs> yeah, this was one that we tended to praise pretty well, I guess. Uh, I can't even think of anything I didn't like, to be honest. The style was a bit halting by nature of the project. Yes. Yeah. And I think we've got at that from a couple of angles. Um, that, yeah, it, it drags in the middle because the author committed to doing every single entry for this entire year of writing between them. And in the middle of it, I kind of lost some energy to keep going, not because it was bad writing, but just because... It was repetitive. It was repetitive. Mm. You know, mm -hmm. it's the same same grievances, same situation. The little girl's mad at her brothers for embarrassing her in front of her crush, mm -hmm. which is fair, and that would be really in a, a diary of a girl this age, of course, but did we need, like, all of it? Probably no, not. Probably, probably not. not. And then again, I'm not sure how much I would have cut down, though, if, if I was That's, the editor of this. Yeah, it's it, a tough uh, question. It, it, it's a difficult call. It would have been a different project because... The way you read it, it's very predicated on knowing everything that has been said between them. Yeah. Um, but but as a reading experience, it makes it it made it drag for me, mm. especially yeah. like something like fifty, sixty percent of the way through. I forgave myself for skimming sometimes, yeah, yeah. which yeah. I don't usually do, mm. but I did on on occasion. I did too, up until from a certain point up until when things really kick into high gear towards yeah. the end. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they, they dumped on uh, on Hufflepuffs for a bit. And that was it. Yeah. 
leave the Hufflepuffs alone. <laughs> <laughs> They're awesome. <laughs> yeah, I, I like that Tom Riddle is like, why is that even a house? <laughs> Rude. I think he's like, I'd wipe them all out if I could. So. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I definitely think my main complaint was definitely the repetition and the dragging. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it's hard to complain about it in a certain way because it mirrors so much the repetition of patterns of abuse as they continue to develop and like become I guess patterns in your own brain like Mm -hmm. when you experience that abuse like it is a repetition of those ideas like the things that Tom instills in Jenny like becoming repetitious but I think when it did shift to Jenny trying to rebel from Tom that was a lot like there were many scenes of her just being like fighting and not being able to succeed and maybe that's realistic too, but yeah, I, I think I would agree that there could have been less of a lot of that stuff. I, as, I mean, I don't know for sure if that's true, but as I a think piece there of could writing by itself, it obviously couldn't stand because mm-hmm. it's it's an addition to a story that's mm-hmm. already been written. It is not the typical hero's journey, like hero, you know, sure. crossing the threshold and mentor and all like that journey. It's not there. It's like it's like a day in a life sort of style but across a year so Mm -hmm. it's it can't stand on its own it needs those details to kind of pack a harder punch at the end to make it work which i think it does but yeah it's it's definitely not you know a standalone yeah piece of work that can just be read as it is it would it would totally confuse anybody who read it who hadn't read chamber of secrets Well, that kind of leads me into what I was going to say, which is, like, just that there is that level of repetition. It is dependent on another story. And as you get towards the end, you don't really get a sense of resolution because the resolution Mm -hmm. comes from the main story. That was the biggest problem, I think, yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And that's very difficult to read because it's very emotional. And while I think it's real in many ways, I think it... Yeah, it carries a lot of, like, emotional, like, storytelling problems in the sense that it stagnates in various areas. Mm-hmm. And I can't complain too hard about it, but it does, Things like, stagnate in those areas. Because yes. it's in the actual book. And... Because, yeah, because yeah. they're referencing the original source, and they're doing a very good job of remaining loyal to that. So that's why it's a hard criticism to make. But as a story, yeah, it stagnates. Dom, you were talking about the end of it being unsatisfying, and you reread the end of Chamber of Secrets. Yeah. And you were saying earlier that you don't think uh, Ginny's portrayal in the book quite matches up with this fanfic? No. Uh, just by the nature of the focus of the character of this fanfic being Ginny and the other one being Harry Potter, like by nature, it kind of skips a lot of Ginny's development. But I think even with that in mind, the Ginny character in Chamber of Secrets is pretty weak. Mm. And it doesn't show any signs of trauma, particularly after this, or um, like like they ma- they laugh and make a joke at the end. After after all this, like after reading the last few entries of this fanfic and imagining waking up, the next thing like quipping after that is like n- not <laughs> not not believable. In terms of providing a different resolution, do you think that this fanfic could have used an epilogue? That's the question because like the form of the fanfic is someone writing in a diary, right? So then it would have to be, the resolution would have to be Jenny writing in a diary immediately after spending half a year of being psychologically and physically tortured by a diary, which now, wouldn't make a lot of sense. It could, do you think an epilogue would work if it was farther in the future, her writing in a diary? That is probably not magic. Like next year or like year five or something? Being yeah, maybe. interviewed yeah. by that I, terrible I'm, journalist lady? Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, actually, yeah. actually that's not bad. Uh, but... But would that be a satisfying resolution? I'm just spitballing here. I'm thinking, like, what would have tied more of a bow onto the end of the fanfic? Honestly, I mean, I just wished I had a copy of the book with me to read, so Mm. I felt better about that dark ending. It was honestly a little bit jarring, because going from this fanfic to Chamber of Secrets, the quality of the writing dipped (laughs) significantly. Do do witches and wizards have therapists? (laughs) Like, I feel like if Um, I were a mom, I'd, like, send her to talk to somebody. I don't think they're mentioned. I don't think that's their uh, mindset, because we just found out recently from the Potterbore Twitter that wizards and witches (laughs) didn't even have bathrooms. They would just 
go and then use a spell to vanish the, the yeah. Enemies. And, and didn't you say that you don't learn that spell until like fifth year? Until so fifth year I school. Think, <laughs> so what do you do? I think that's BS. <laughs> <laughs> hey, it's canon. It's the Pottermore uh, t- Twitter account. Uh, wait, wait, I know, I've seen that multiple times you? before. There's and bathrooms I just don't in Hogwarts. <laughs> but Moaning Myrtle's in a bathroom. What no, are no, but they're well, a new they were invention. installed like in the oh. late 1800s or something. Yeah, but after the 18th century. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, let's. Let's finish up. Is there anything that we want to praise specifically about the fanfic that we, uh, or, you know, just re-identify as a particular strength of the fanfic because we've had some praise already? I kind of reckon, I kind of like that it recognizes actual evil as a thing. Yeah. I thought about why I was, why I'm happy when I see a story or something or a media where there's an actual smart bad guy Mm -hmm. because in a lot of, like children's media, media and even a lot of adult media, the bad guy will be uh, stupid or incompetent or a lot of other things to kind of show you that it's not a problem. And I kind of just like the respect of, of a creator to saying that evil things are there and they're real and it's an actual threat. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I appreciate the uh, um, exploration of that space. Of course, that goes... That remains true right up until it hits the J.K. Rowling again. And in the actual ending of Chamber of Secrets, Tom Riddle's all like, before I kill you, Mr. Bond. Mm-hmm. Mustache <laughs> twirl. Yeah. Well, I like it was still to... being written for kids. Yeah. Fair. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I like to piggyback off of what Dom was saying. And it, it's not simply the fact that, like, this is actual evil per se, but that, like, I think something I tried to identify before is that abusers are real people with Mm -hmm. real emotional problems and i think this author dived into a little bit of that like when tom being raised in an orphanage as the incidental image that jenny wasn't supposed to see becomes a thing that he reacts to you see the emotional roots for this form of abuse and you see that it's a real thing because i think something we get susceptible to in our society is thinking that we can't be victims because the people that we love are sympathetic people. Like if our abusers are people we can care about because we understand their emotional problems, then we think that we aren't being abused. And I think this fan fiction did a really good job of exploring the real language of gaslighting and grooming and abuse while literally seeing Voldemort, who it, I think in the source material is pretty cartoonishly you know, one dimensional yeah to, uh, yeah uh, using this opportunity of the young voldemort that was presenting a chamber of secrets to see a real person who could be an abuser i agree i think yeah. that it was an excellent portrayal of a villain who isn't just magic hitler <laughs> you know it's, yeah. it's a, yeah. a flawed sad human being who just wants to inflict their pain on other people and that sounds like magic hitler yeah <laughs> but but more. Does that make Grindelwald um, the uh, magic Kaiser? I guess. Yeah, I sure. guess he's magic Hitler, and then who's? I don't know. Magic Stalin. I think it's World War One, World War Two. No. Yeah. Uh, Voldemort's two. Yeah, I guess Grindelwald's so. One. Yeah, 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 yeah. Even though it takes place in World War Two and the 1970s. Yeah. Anyway, um, but I I just have to admire Arabella, whoever you are, for your dedication mm-hmm. to character development in this yeah. that it was the main driving force it yes. was excellent. extremely character driven and and i just imagine this person sitting and writing with an open chamber yes. of secrets right next to them i yeah. was going to say speaking of dedication i probably would have taken anything that you three said first because those are definitely the strong <laughs> points but i it always makes me happy to see someone being so geeky about their continuity mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. this person just paid did all the continuity drawing and close reading and like everything they could and it's always really cool to see the results of that yeah to the point where i kind of kind of feel like chamber of secrets is referencing this one as opposed to the other one <laughs> Seriously, yeah exactly yeah. so i think in general high praise for this fan fiction yeah 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 it, it was a little strange how she ended every entry saying still not king <laughs> <laughs> that's my fan fiction joke i know <laughs> Uh, th- there was a very famous Lord of the Rings fanfic CJ called The Very Secret Diaries. Oh. Yes. By our good friend um, Cassandra Clare. Hmm. And Aragorn ended all of his entries writing Still Not King. <laughs> Which is really funny. <laughs> P.S. Still, Still Not, not King. King. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Maybe tomorrow. <laughs> 
that's funny. Anyway, I no. Mean, the best jokes you have to explain the kind. <laughs> <laughs> well, CJ was looking kind of lost there. I was just like, I could just nod through this. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's not like we, the uh, listeners can see your nod, so they'll just assume you understand. It's better to say nothing and have everyone think you know everything. But generally well, speaking... you tell me. <laughs> I think the phrase is, it's better to keep your mouth shut and let people think you're a fool than to open it and prove them right. That's it. That's the one. Yeah. Now you told me this. Gosh. <laughs> now, next time we are stretching the bounds of our premise with the retro fanfic and going up into the extremely recent past of 2006... Gasp. It, it pains me to go that new. It's like shining. It hurts my eyes. <laughs> Pretend that it's 1996. I think it's retro enough. It's retro enough because it is an Avatar The Last Airbender fanfic. Mm-hmm. And, you know, Avatar feels like it's been around for a while, right? Right. Not I to mention that is. this fanfic, Tempest in a Teacup, came out at the end of... Or after the first season came out, apparently. Yeah, and uh, so it it uh, this fanfic came out on the day that book two, season one aired, mm-hmm. uh, episode one aired. So I'm very interested to see what the fans were doing with the characters at that point in the fandom, and I I hope we'll all find it interesting. The link to that one is bit.ly/rfr/tempest, hmm. uh, which should not take you to a copy of Shakespeare's The Tempest if I've set it up properly. <laughs> If you need to find Shakespeare's The Tempest, there's copies of it all over online. This one's on fanfiction.net, though. Uh, CJ, sorry we won't be having you back for the Avatar fanfic next week. I will learn to forgive you. But I'm sure (laughs) we'll have you back for something. Sounds good. It sounds like um, you created a whole gargoyle clan when you were young. That came up in conversation. We have to talk about that. That's my one, like, slight foray in fanfic. I was in, like, fourth or fifth grade. Yeah, you have to come back and bring that with you. Yes. I will, I will. And based entirely on that, I'm going to have to find another Gargoyles fanfic just for that reason. Yeah, and then we can post all the pictures of the characters on yeah. the site. Yeah. I'll cherry pick the best ones. Excellent. <laughs> Good. I'm going to revitalize the Gargoyles fandom with these great characters, I'm sure. It Sorry, that, it. that sounded too sarcastic. No, no, no. It's it's totally warranted. They're the best characters ever, obviously. Mm -hmm. No. But gargoyles should be loved by everyone everywhere. Absolutely. Agreed. And I really don't understand what people have kind of like left by the wayside. Can we do a gargoyles reboot? Like we'll all collab on it, you know? Well we'll talk about it on our our gargoyles podcast. Okay. (laughs) If you can find a Demona one, she's my favorite character. Okay. She's Mm -hmm. like the only female anti-hero I know. I've ever known. Yeah. From mm-hmm. um, at least my childhood. Oh, really? She's fascinating. I, I did like her a lot. Yeah. Female anti-hero? Well, mm-hmm. what about Carmen San Diego? I suppose, but she and doesn't like, have a lot of, like, backstory. You don't know what, why. What, like, Black right? Cat from like, Spider-Man the point is, and you, you Catwoman? Do. Carmen San Diego was a, a lot of them. Carmen San Diego was an agent of Acme, but... It was too easy for her. She was too good at it. Yeah, but like so. Carmen San Diego's password to stop the apocalypse wasn't alone, so it's not as dark. Where's the pain, Amato? <laughs> I want the pain. The pain. Isn't she just a femme fatale? Aren't femme fatales female antiheroes? I feel like it's a very common for me, archetype. For me, it's not. It's it's watching someone make hard decisions mm-hmm. and have real reasons for going down what you perceived an evil path, but being a hero in and of themselves and like I really see. relating with that journey with sure, them, sure. but still seeing them as kind of a villain. Well, like, CJ relates to making evil decisions because I, I she's do. done so many. Yes. <laughs> yes. Don't tell anyone that. Too they late. Must not, they must not know my real name. I am Lord... Um, <laughs> wait, wait, wait. <laughs> yeah, J- well, what J- can you get? JC? No. That's pretty good. I am Lord Jesus Christ. I am Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, Dom, I think you worked this out for your own name, right? Yeah, it turns out if I was an evil lord, oh, right. I'd be, um, I am Viking Jerseys Dodkins. No. <laughs> we were all very distressed to realize Dom's true secret. I spent too much time on an anagram website. <laughs> I found out if I can make the phrase, I am Viking, and just just let it go for a bit. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah just yeah. keep that. I tried to find some sort of British royalty uh, a nobility rank in there but i couldn't have duke or lord or uh, hmm. t-baron i don't know what else there is in t-baron <laughs> that's okay viking is threatening enough yeah <laughs> i am viking <laughs> as for that's this pretty good this was episode 20 of retro fanfic retrospective the very secret diary singular not plural hmm. you can find a copy of it on fanfiction.net posted by someone who was not the author Arabella. It was reposted there. Our link there is bit.ly slash RFR secret. 
The intro song is The Weekly Fear, off of the album Popey's Incredible Adventure by Komiku. The outro song is Run Against the Universe from the same album. You can find that album and other works by Komiku at loyaltyfreakmusic.com. You can find our website at retrofanficretrospective.podbean.com or bit.ly slash retrofanfic. If you have any questions, comments, or thoughts about the episode, please leave comments, leave reviews, send us an email at retrofanficretrospective at gmail.com. If your questions, comments, or thoughts are sufficiently short, you can tweet at us at retrofanfic. I'm Amato. I'm Tori. Sorry, I was looking, I was trying to figure out my Patronus. Uh, any results yet? <laughs> Not yet. I'm Dom. My Patronus is a St. Bernard. I'm CJ. My Patronus is probably a rabbit. <laughs> well, have oh. you taken the test? No. Potter Boy needs to tell you. I Mine is a black swan, oh, apparently. Oh, classy. Oh, that's yeah. classy. Like that. But it can't be black, because Patroni are all, like, Well, white. it'd be, like, grayscale colored. Yeah, uh, that's a good okay. point. <laughs> anyway, we are just four Earth life forms trying to be nice to each other. Until next time, take care. Expect a landing song. <laughs> <Be over. laughs> Patronus is a St. Bernard. Okay, oh. I see that. I never did do the Patronus thing. I'm curious. That's great. Wait, how do you find that out? Uh, Pottermore. Nice. They have a test. And you answer a bunch of questions and they show you a thing. Uh, well. And because it's a test on Pottermore, that means that when you take it, the answer yes. is canon. Yeah. Of course. <laughs> By the, way, my, going there. by the way, my wand is a uh, cypress wood with unicorn hair core, 14 and a half inches mm-hmm. length, cares? with supple flexibility. I, I, <laughs> I've never understood the wand thing. <laughs> I, don't, I can't I, picture any of them. It, it's more... Okay, um, it matters to me. It, it's more like divining stuff, like personality traits. Mm. Yeah. I kind of yeah. made mm-hmm. fun of my husband for being a, a Hufflepuff, and then he was convinced me totally that Hufflepuffs are the best house and now Hufflepuffs are the best house Hufflepuff is the best house yeah. 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 I agree with Isn't that it? they're just really it's, underrated like it's Rayleigh, Rowling's favorite like, house, she says I was yeah. just talking about this with my co-workers <laughs> related to Harry Potter is that everyone underrates Hufflepuffs like yeah. at least Cho is Ravenclaw and has is a main character, but like nobody's a main character in Hufflepuff. Cedric is for a hot second yeah oh yeah Cedric yeah she did bring that up but, but like but how the sorting actually works is that if you're an asshole, then you get separated by a type of asshole into Ravenclaw, Gryffindor, or Slytherin. Yeah. If you're not an asshole, then you're Hufflepuff. That sounds right. I can't argue yeah. with that. <laughs> I really do think that I'm probably meant to be a Hufflepuff, because they seem like the nice ones. They're, but, they're loyal friends. No comment, Tori. Yeah. <laughs> That's not about nice. It's about being trusting, said, I think. Yeah. When, when the Battle of Hogwarts I'm very happened, trusting. not a single Hufflepuff like turned away. Yeah, but like, I'm very angry. Fight. Oh, yeah. I'm very angry at her that not a single Slytherin stuck around. Yeah. <laughs> they, they should have. They should have. Yeah, yeah. Slytherin yeah. has yeah. never made sense to me. It's like, are they just all evil? They actually and talk about so, that why the are they all in the Maybe they're just thing. afraid of being... They, there is that part of the fanfic where Ginny, like Ginny says... People for being Slytherin. Ginny says, like, my, my mom says that there was never a bad wizard that wasn't in Slytherin, but that... Can't be true, right? right? Right. That doesn't make any sense. Yeah, uh, Peter and, Pettigrew. Yeah. Uh, there you go. When you Pettigrew. think about it, it's stupid. Some of them must be nice. It can't be a whole house full of prats. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone says there's not a witch or wizard who went bad who wasn't in Slytherin. But I have to wonder, is that true? Never. Not one wizard or witch in any house was ever bad in a thousand years. <laughs> I asked mom about that one this summer. She told me I was too... Asking too many questions, I think she just didn't want to answer. <laughs> yeah, it's really crazy. A thousand crazy. years. Come on. <laughs> like, they literally have, like, an evil house, and right. yet everybody just, like, accepts it. It's like, oh, those are the evil guys. I, All right. Based on your house and boarding school <laughs> as a kid. <laughs> I, I know. They're kids. They're so young. It's a rough world, the <clears throat> wizarding world. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> yep. You got a motto? Uh, I guess so. Okay.